Oh, 
Nitai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo Hari Hari Bo Hari Hari Bo Jai Srila Prabhupada. So hold on a second. I'm in experimental mode. Guru Maharaj, can you please check your internet connection? It seems like that you are using a bad one. I can't see you properly. <laughs> you are freezing all the time. The eternal problem, the internet connection. Yeah, give it a minute, it'll get better. Count to three and it'll change. One, two, three. Is it better now? So, Nadia, it looks like you're doing kitchen religion like I did last week. So, um, just let me know how it goes. I don't know if I can do anything. Right. I don't know if I can change this connection. It's on the fastest one. I could restart my um, router, but then you'd lose me. How is it? Is it okay or no? It is good, not freezing. Okay. So, Namo Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shurimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sharashwati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sanivari Paschati Vasatani. Panchakapa Tubyas Chakra Pashinda Vyavicha. Potitanam Pavane Vyo Bhishna Vyo Namona Maha. Mukam Karuti Vachalam Pangulangayate Girim. Yakrapa Tamaham Vande Sri Guru Dina Tarinam. So I am on a different computer and so it's a different setup so i just have to get a little organized here and while i'm getting organized i'm gonna tell you something that i heard yesterday from srila Prabhupada that uh, explains something that we were talking about explains it a little further so you, you remember we were talking about, I gave a little history. You remember that? Of um, the, the, the first disciples of Prabhupada who became gurus. And, um, you know, there was, there was a feeling and understanding that, that they were especially advanced beyond everyone else's advancement. You remember that discussion? Yes? And then the illusion was dispelled when some of them had trouble. 
And then the pendulum swung the other way. And some people said, well, only Prabhupada's a pure devotee. First, these 11 were all especially pure. And then after Prabhupada left, and they, some had difficulty, then some people were saying, well, none of them are pure devotees, only Prabhupada's a pure devotee. Or there may be some pure devotees on the planet, they're just not in ISKCON, they're in the Gaudiya Mat, or some branch of the Gaudiya Vaishnavism, there are great souls, Prabhupada's godbrothers, or disciples of Prabhupada's godbrothers, who are amazing Vaishnavas. But since we were born in America or Europe, um, we couldn't possibly be qualified to be guru. And because to be guru, you have to be a pure devotee. And we see uh, that these pure devotees, some of them had difficulty. And if some of them had difficulty, it means they all, it's just a matter of time, they're all going to have difficulty. Or it reveals the nature of their consciousness, even of the people who haven't fallen. So that, that was the idea. And so we have been talking about another idea of pure devotee. So yesterday morning, I heard a lecture in which Prabhupada said three things. And it's three things that I've already said, but since Prabhupada said them, I just want to repeat them as he said them. He said, number one, I am not perfect. Number two, I don't say that I'm a pure devotee. Or which is, or he either said, I don't say I'm perfect, I'm not a pure devotee, or I, I'm not perfect, I don't say I'm a pure devotee. The same thing. And number three, my success is that I follow a pure devotee. Oh, and number four, and if you follow a pure devotee, then whatever you do is pure. Now this is, we talked about this, but what is important about this is that I may feel that I'm not pure and naturally we all feel that way. And Prabhupada is asking us to do things which pure devotees do or elevated devotees do. And we think, how can I do that? I am not qualified. And so Prabhupada is saying, if you are not pure, but if you represent the pure and you explain what the pure explains, you do what the pure tells you to do, then you are pure. And, and you are engaged in pure devotional service, and you're engaging other people in pure devotional service. Pure devotional service in the sense that the knowledge is pure, the process is pure, and you are giving a pure process, right? Like I couldn't, I can, sometimes you have professors that teach business, right? And, and so they understand they have degrees in business, but some of them actually don't have practical experience. Maybe if they went out in the world, they wouldn't be as successful as some businessmen who, never, who don't have degrees. It's possible, right? And not possible, it happens, right? So they don't have to be successful businessmen to teach business. They just have to understand the principles and give those principles to their students. And the students can utilize the principles. So you may be here, you may be here, you may be here, but if you give what your guru gave, then you're giving something which is pure and you're giving a pure process. And the process therefore is pure. So it, it this is important because as we discussed, Prabhupada said, I want all my disciples to be guru. So when you hear the word guru, the word guru is fine, but when you hear the word you before guru, then that's when the shock hits, right? Guru, you know, we need gurus. We need, yeah, we need 10,000 gurus. It's fine until we say, and you're going to be one of them. And then, you know, no, not me. Are you kidding me? I, you know, <clears throat> I can hardly get my hand on my bead bag. But when, when we say, no, your job is to take what you have heard, 
take what you've understood and then explain that to other people and don't don't change it add your realization but don't don't water it down don't um, misunderstand it you understand it you practice it you have realization whatever that realization is you share you share what you've heard now you're a guru that's what it means to be guru so that in that sense Prabhupada was saying we need thousands of gurus all my disciples he, he once did mathematical calculations that I have 5,000 disciples so all my disciples they have five ten thousand then we have um, eventually um, we will have a hundred thousand gurus million gurus and he was trying to you know think figuring well how many gurus do we need to get the whole world you know so if we have thousands of gurus each with five thousand i mean you can do the math how many gurus we would need but he was going up in the millions a million gurus with five thousand yeah a million gurus with a, with seven and a half thousand disciples that's seven and a half billion isn't it if i've done my math right is it not yes what to speak uh, yeah a million gurus and they each make anyway so let me get out your calculator a million gurus they each make if they eat, if one guru makes a thousand disciples that's a billion right oh so you only need seven gurus <laughs> anyway Prabhupada was making a calculation how many gurus you would need how many disciples you would need uh, for the whole world and he was thinking of us he 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 never said well you're not qualified so i'm asking my god brothers to come in and they'll they will initiate they will be the guru so he never said that he always said us so if you think of the guru as someone on srila Prabhupada's stature then when you say you have to be a guru it's understandable you would say that's not possible i can't do that but when you take it as you take what you've learned you share it you follow it you try to understand it as clearly as possible from your spiritual master from Srila Prabhupada, from senior devotees, with your own intelligence and super soul guiding you with discussions on philosophy, clarification. You just keep trying to understand it more and more, practice it better and better, and share your understanding with others. Then you are giving pure devotional service. You are engaged in pure devotional service, and you are a guru. If we don't have that understanding, then we're going to say none of the gurus are qualified only Prabhupada is qualified or we will say maybe a few of them are qualified and they're also maybe qualified or more qualified gurus outside of this one that's that's the conclusion either only Prabhupada is the guru or only a few people and that was not what Prabhupada said he never said that so i thought that was interesting i'm not perfect i'm not a pure devotee but i give what my spiritual master gave so he's he's saying the qualification to be guru is not that you're perfect and not that you're pure devotee in the sense of mahabhagwat but that you are purely following if you purely follow then it's pure and then you deliver something pure right does that make sense so, ladies and gentlemen, you are the next generation of gurus in this one. And you say, no, no, no. But you're already doing it. That's the thing. Um, I think that's where maybe we've misunderstood. When you are teaching someone about Krishna, you are being guru. And that's why Mahaprabhu said, Yare Dake Tare Kaha Krishna Upadesa. Wherever you go, we can make a song about that. You know, that's wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be wherever, I'll be writing right here, waiting for you. Wherever you go, wherever you do, wherever you go, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. We just change the words a little bit. And Yahe Tari Tahe Kaha Krishna Upades Amara Agai Guru Hana Kare Edesha. By my order, I'm you can become guru because because you can't become guru just you wake up one morning and decide. Today, I'm a guru. No, 
your guru because your guru told you to do this. It's on his order. So Mahaprabhu says, by my order, you're now empowered and you become guru. And so he he told this to a grihasta devotee. And it wasn't like, okay, get the elephant. You'll be riding in. You'll be riding home on an elephant tonight with an umbrella over you and 10 people with fans. And that's that's not what Mahaprabhu was saying. He was saying, this is what guru means in the, in the most foundational sense, teacher. You tell whoever you meet, wherever you go, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. That's my order to you. On this order, you will be guru. And if you do this, I will protect you. I will always be there and I will always protect you. So I think it's important to understand that when Prabhupada started this movement, that's what he told us to do. So from day one, in a sense, we were guru. From day one, in a sense, we were pure devotees because we were just telling people what we heard from Prabhupada. We were only speaking what the pure devotee had sp spoken. Now, another point which, which supports this, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you look at the early, early, early editions of Back to Godhead, there's a, it's just an article by Prabhupada and then all articles by other devotees, which is basically the way it is today, but it's a little more <clears throat> style, stylized is not the word, it's more evolved today, but then it was just one article after another after another, and then they had some pictures of Prabhupada wanted some pictures of Sankirtan, Harinam Sankirtan, because that's what we were doing. So they had pictures, devotees, and you know, Los Angeles, Harinam Sankirtan, and Boston, you know, they put, they have that section. And basically, that's all it was. Prabhupada's article, and then very, very, very philosophical articles by Prabhupada's disciples, and then some pictures of Harinam Sankirtan, and maybe an ad for Bhagavad Gita or something. That's the old, that was the Back to Godhead's uh, magazine that I read in, in those days. That's what it was, right? So that's the way Prabhupada wanted it. So naturally the disciples said, Prabhupada, why don't we put more of your articles in it? And Prabhupada said, well, your articles, you are just, you are just repeating in your own words, according to your realization, what you heard from me. So actually, those are my articles also. I, uh, there's no difference. But that's interesting, isn't it? Because again, this idea that, well, there's Prabhupada and then there's us. And so he's the guru and we're not. Well, he's the founder Acharya, but we're also little gurus because we are explaining as best we can in our own, according to our realization and understanding, what he said. So he felt those articles were written by him. That's what he said. Actually, I'm writing those. Those are my articles. Interesting, isn't it? So um, this also underscores the point that to be a follower of Prabhupada, to be a disciple, Siksha disciple or Diksha disciple, whatever the case, you represent what he taught as, as without uh, as best you, you can, according to your intelligence and understanding. And you always are trying to understand it more deeply, more deeply, more deeply for your own benefit. And because you're going to share that with others and you want to be clear, right? Isn't it? And what Prabhupada understood. And so now little old Gerda in Lithuania is going to become guru in Lithuania. And so many people are going to follow her and ask her a million questions about Krishna because they don't know anything. And she's been around a few years and she knows way more than they do. And she has way more realization <clears throat> because she's practicing. And she might say, but I don't practice it that well. To which I say, but they don't practice it at all. So they don't know anything. And you can show them the practice. And the other benefit of it is then Gerda thinks, well, if I'm going to teach them how to chant, I think I should improve my chanting because I don't want to be a hypocrite. So in that way, sharing helps you because you, you know you really need to follow what you're teaching so you benefit from that. And I think I was telling you, I may have told you that uh, when I was a young devotee in one temple, 
everybody gave Bhagavad Gita class, even the new people, they were on the roster. So you move in like a week later, you're okay, you're giving Bhagavad Gita class on uh, two weeks on Tuesday night. Okay. Um, obviously, it wasn't a problem because, you know, the oldest devotee was like 22 and been a devotee a year. So you came in at 20 and you're, you're a new devotee. It's not like he knew so much or she knew so much more. And we all were happy to listen. Just, you know, we were like, well, you know, they'll tell us something. We can learn something, something they read. So that was Prabhupada's sense of becoming guru. And it doesn't mean that someone has to be a Diksha guru. Uh, normally what happens is that when one is a Siksha guru, at least traditionally when one is a Siksha guru, and of course a very advanced devotee, um, the people that he's instructing, uh, if they're benefiting from that instruction and, and that person is their primary guru, they would want to take Diksha from him. But many times it worked the other way around where there would be a guru that gives Diksha, but he's not giving Siksha or not much. So when you would get Diksha, he would say, now you go to this guru and take instruction. We have the story of Narottam Das Thakur, Duki Krishna Das, and who else? There's one other. Why can't I remember? Who's the other? Was it Baladev? Vidyabhushan? I can't remember. Um, he was their six-year guru, and he was guiding them. So their gurus would give diksha and said, now you go to Jiva Goswami. And he, he will be your Siksha guru and you will guide him. And he was their main guru. So traditionally, it, it often happened that way, that the main guru was the Siksha guru. The Diksha guru was not that involved for, for various reasons. So in, in ISKCON, because Prabhupada was both the Diksha guru and the Siksha guru, and because Prabhupada was a founder of Acharya, he naturally had a, a, a position, a uh, unique position in ISKCON and a position that no one else could have or will ever have. But when we transitioned after Prabhupada left, as I said in the last class or the class before, there was the thinking that, well, the leaven should just be doing what Prabhupada did, living like he lived, um, having that, the power and dominance, control, and respect that he had. And so that created, it created um, a problem because then all the power was invested in the Diksha Guru. And so you had these 11, um, for example, uh, in 1977, Prabhupada leaves and they, they begin initiating in 1978. So the people coming from from November onwards, or even some who came earlier who weren't initiated, would now be initiated by the new gurus. So if you do the math, it's predominantly God brothers, and then a few new disciples, right, in 78. You could imagine, right? So if we go back to 1978, maybe in the temple, there are 10, like I was in Los Angeles, where was I in 1978? Yeah, I think I was in Los Angeles. It was a huge temple, hundreds of devotees. So maybe there were 300 devotees there, and maybe 290 were Prabhupada disciples, and 10 were disciples of the new guru, right? So for him to dominate that temple as Prabhupada dominated didn't make any sense because we're, we're all God brothers and God sisters, right? I mean, wouldn't that be weird, you know, if one of your God brothers or God sisters just like all of a sudden surrender to me or leave is gone, you know, I'm the one. And that you, you would you would think no this is there's something wrong here so you would think naturally okay here's this guru but he's got all these god brothers and god sisters so they're all going to help him right take care of his disciples but then gradually he got more disciples and he had hundreds of disciples and it was like 50 50 but um it would just make sense oh this is really easy he's got so many god brothers God sisters, they can help him take care of his disciples. It's a family affair. We're all going to help. Didn't happen that way. 
So because it didn't happen that way, well, the reason it didn't happen that way is because, as I said, we had Prabhupada's example as this one dominant Diksha Siksha Guru. He was like everything to the disciples. And although our God brothers and God sisters helped us, but we never, we never really saw them so much as Siksha Gurus. It was just like Prabhupada was everything. So that continued. And then when we understood, well, it really shouldn't be that way, it it kind of continued anyway, because we had given so much emphasis on taking initiation from a guru and so little importance on the Siksha guru. Even though the Siksha gurus were there, they weren't recognized. In, in other words, Siksha is always there, whether you call it Siksha or not. The, there are always people who are helping you, right? There's always somebody, you know, who, you, who you, in your temple, who's like the senior person, the counselor, the pundit, uh, or somebody you're hearing from now on the internet. There's always, uh, there's always other people. It's never that you're just learning from one person. But that paradigm continued. It was like, oh, you know, um, you hear from the Diksha Guru. You don't even, <clears throat> it's not even good to hear from other gurus because then you're being unchaste. You know, that idea was there. So we understood that was wrong, but it was embedded in the culture. Right. So now in the culture of ISKCON, even though you may have a Siksha Guru, in some cases you don't even recognize that this person is your Siksha Guru. You don't, even though it, for all intents and purposes that relationship exists as Siksha, you don't recognize it. You don't, you don't know it. And, and it may not have happened to you yet, but at some point in your life it will. There will be someone who you see is this is another guru for me. This person is very important in my life. And it can happen for some disciples, that person becomes more important than their Diksha guru. And it's not wrong, it's not bad, it's just is. It's just, it's, it's a natural evolution. The only way it would be bad is if one became offensive to their Diksha guru and thought, oh, I don't need him anymore. I've got my Siksha guru. We'll just, you know, forget about him and yeah. He doesn't know much. My Siksha Guru, he's a scholar. My Diksha Guru, what does he know? He just knows how to do kirtan and you know, tell jokes. So that would be offensive. You know, it's not like that. There's always this you know, special relationship with Diksha Guru. This is the person who brought you to the Parampura, who's taking your karma. You know, usually the Diksha Guru is, is, is often the one who, brought, who's, who raised you, you know, in Krishna consciousness so much. So, um, but my point is, that a lot of devotees have 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 six year gurus, and um, let's say in the '90s, late '80s, '90s, um, there were a lot of six year gurus because the position of diksha guru was kind of stabilizing, you could say, and so it was allowing devotees who weren't diksha gurus to take more prominent positions in ISKCON as teachers and as as gurus, uh, especially disciples of uh, disciples of Prabhupada who couldn't be gurus. But you know, learned a lot of sannyasis, having a lot of influence, and the siksha disciple relationship was developing. But a lot of devotees didn't call it that; they didn't recognize it that that because they thought we could only have that with a diksha guru. So it was, it was, I think, two reasons because we didn't understand the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism that that often the most prominent guru was not the Diksha guru, it was the Siksha guru. And plus we had this, from the time that Prabhupada left, this very inflated understanding of Diksha and it kind of just remained there. So um, that's where we ended up today. So going, going back to the point that you are Diksha Guru, uh, you are Siksha Gurus, if you're helping somebody in, in, a, in the broadest sense of the word, even if they don't, you don't have a relationship, they don't recognize you as a Siksha Guru per se, but, but objectively speaking, if you're helping somebody and guiding them, you are their Siksha Guru. They just may not realize it. And, it may, and therefore it may not establish as an actual Guru-Disciple relationship and probably 
you wouldn't want it to be because it would make you uncomfortable and you would feel unqualified. But at some point in time, if you're helping somebody, you will realize actually this person needs me and depends on me and I have to be an example for them. And I have to understand Krishna consciousness because I'm guiding them and I want to guide them correctly. And if you take that responsibility, it's very enriching for you because it, it forces you, right? I have to be a good example. This person depends on me. I have to understand Prabhupada's books. They're asking me all these questions, like these intricate, nuanced questions, and I don't understand all the answers. I have to go back, study Prabhupada's books. I, I have to discuss these things. I have to ask my guru, what is this? So it, it's very nurturing. So if we if we bring the concept of siksha down to a more realistic level, practical level, that, that will be healthier. And um, we, also, we also have the reality that um, those Diksha gurus who started initiating in the 1980s now have 5,000 disciples, 10,000, 20,000. Uh, I think Jai Takamaraj is now over 50,000. Is that correct, Kama Lakshi? I thought he was going to stop at 50,000. No. No, he hasn't stopped. So, um, though th that, uh, when a guru has that many disciples, I don't think you can remember, I don't think you can remember your disciples' names over 150. I think after 150, unless, you know, you're dealing with them. I mean, could you imagine you have 50,000 disciples and you've given them names and you, and you have to remember all of them? That would be a challenge, wouldn't it? And a lot of those names you gave, you didn't even come up with. You had disciples, secretaries who came up with the names and you just gave the names in a letter and maybe never even saw the person. There's not even a face to the name. You know, that's, it's institutional, right? So those, um, those disciples are listening to that guru, they're inspired by that guru, they're connected to the sangha of other disciples, but they also feel the need for siksha gurus, right? So th those gurus need a lot of help. Because how can you minister to 50,000 disciples? Yeah. The other thing, the other thing is Bhakti Sanatya Sarasvati Thakur said something really, really interesting. I'm not sure any of you have heard this before, but it was a talk or a letter or a lecture, I'm not sure. He said, when you give a lecture, it has some benefit, but when you personally guide someone, it has more benefit. It's because the lectures are like they're general, but then you have to you have to figure out how to apply it. And so if you have someone who can counsel you how to apply it in your life, you benefit more. So he was giving more you know, emphasis to what we would call a coach in today's world. Not, not, he wasn't talking about like therapy in, in the sense of psychological problem, but more like a coach, mentor, six year guru, however you want to call it. So, you know, obviously a guru with that many disciples cannot do that with many, if any. So in come the six year gurus the ones that people can ask questions to. I mean, some gurus are, can be six gurus because they don't have that many disciples. I think once you get over two or 300, then, then it's difficult. Um, you can only deal with so many. Steve Jobs only dealt with seven. Did you know that? I think he had six or seven. He said, I can only deal with six people. He had like six departments. And a head, and he would deal with the head of each department. Just, that's all I can deal with. You know, I mean, you could imagine if a lot's going on. You have a meeting every day with each one of them for an hour and a half. Your day's gone, right? So, yeah. So that's the introduction to today's class, based on what I heard Prabhupada say. I am not perfect. I am not a pure devotee, but I'm delivering pure devotional service. That's what he asked us to do also. So you can say the same thing. I'm not pure. I'm not pure, pure devotee. But what we're talking about in this class is that potentially you are a pure devotee. And simultaneously, even if you haven't, if you're not fully realized, you're engaged in pure devotional service. And we, we call it pure 
because you're purely, if you're purely following, we call it pure. If you're doing it to please Prabhupada, we call it pure. If you're doing it to please Krishna, we call it pure. Even though you're not pure. That's, that's the point to get. Okay, I'm not pure. But can I, can I offer something to Krishna out of love for Krishna's pleasure? I can do that, right? You can do that. Even if you're not pure, you can do it purely. Right? Krishna, I want to be pure, and I'm offering this for your pleasure. Um, I, remember, um, I remember many times I would chant my rounds and I would pray to Prabhupada that I know you, you want these books distributed, and I'm not so good at it, so please empower me to do it. Please, whatever, whatever I need to be able to do it, please, I, I want to do it. And that's all I want to do. And when I think back, I actually was thinking, thinking on this the other day, because in the Japa workshop, we were telling the devotees, you should cry. Cry for what? Cry for what's important. And I remember, it's probably 1972 or 73, I'd just come back from traveling Sankirtan, and we had just like driven in maybe like four in the morning or 3.30. We had just driven in to the temple. And Prabhupada was in the temple. And you could you could actually go outside Prabhupada's room because and you could chant, you know, you could actually look at his room. So I remember I was there and I was just like crying, Prabhupada, empower me, please empower me to do this. And so at that point I had been a devotee two years. But when I think back on it, I I think that. At that point, that desire was pure. That's what I wanted. I, I wasn't, I, I just wanted to be empowered by Prabhupada. And, and oftentimes, and oftentimes I chant and I, I pray to Prabhupada, make me an instrument for your mission. So it's similar, you know, I'm sure you've all felt that need to be an instrument. And when you pray that way, and you're very intensely praying to be an instrument, even though I'm so impure, but I want to be an instrument. That's very pure, right? Because that's your motive. That's, that's your only motive at that point is to be pure. Now, does that mean you are pure? Does that mean you don't have material desires? No, not at all. You may have 108 different forms of material desire, but what what you want to bring to the table, so to speak, to Krishna's, what you want to bring to Krishna's table, or what you do bring to Krishna's table is, Krishna, I want to be an instrument in your service. I want to, I want to be qualified to serve you. I want to be qualified to please you. I want to be, I want to be qualified to, to dance with you. That's, that's, what, that's what's in your heart. And if that's in your heart, that we call that pure devotional service, even though there's so many other things in your heart. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I just, you know, I know I've said this in a hundred different ways, a hundred times, but um, it's important in the sense that it's been misunderstood a lot. And that was the whole cause of this Ritvik movement is based on that misunderstanding. There can only be Prabhupada as a pure devotee, everyone else is bogus. And it's also, um, it's also good managerially. Well, you know, everybody's unified now. It's only one guru solves that problem, right? Uh, a good, you know, so you don't want to take managerial expediency, expediency um, over uh, Siddhanta. That's a mistake. You know? okay, this is the philosophy, but managerially, that philosophy doesn't look so good. It's complicated. Let's just drop the philosophy. And this managerial idea that we're all disciples of Prabhupada, that, that's much better, right? Solves so many problems. Uh -huh. And externally, it does seem to solve problems, and it, it will create more problems than it solves because it's not our philosophy. There will be no more disciplic succession. There will be no per, you know, personal connection, and so on. So now we're going to read. And Nadia is going to tell us where we left off. I forgot. And my computer is not telling me where we left off. You remember? 
Yes, Maharaj, I posted it in the chat. It's the letter of February 4th, 1971. That should be the next um, okay. next letter. Okay. So maybe I should read it off the chat. That way I'll be looking more at you. Well, we have questions. So maybe I should take the questions first. Uh -huh. Let me, I'll take the questions. And then we'll read because we want to stay on, stay on beat here. Okay, so this is from Nadia. And if you're on Facebook, ask away. And we will answer your questions. You say we should add our realizations and share what we've understood. But what if our understanding and realizations are wrong? How can we make sure that what we say is right? Uh, sometimes your realizations cannot be wrong. And I, I would say, you know, uh, one thing you, you can say is that those are your realizations, like personal. This is what has helped me in Krishna consciousness. So it's, it's, there are realizations that cannot be wrong. They're not right or wrong. They're just, they just work for you, right? And, and often you will hear me sometimes give class when someone will ask a question, I'll say, well, for me, this is what I have found that works. And I'm saying that because I don't want to universalize it because I don't, sometimes I, I realize that what works for me is not necessarily universally applicable. It's just, this is, What's your, my personal realization? This is my understanding. I know other people have other realizations and other understandings. And the spiritual world is big enough for different realizations and different understandings. So that's one way you can deal with it. If someone tells you, you're, you know, what you said is wrong, or you doubt perhaps it's wrong, then you want to discuss it with senior devotees and get clarity. But the thing is, that as you progress and you go through these stages of maybe questioning your realizations, clarifying them, each time you clarify it, you've just understood something in our philosophy more clearly. So now you've discussed it with other devotees, you've confirmed, okay, my realization is right, or it was a little off. Now I confirm what is the right realization, the right understanding. And so now that's in your so-called, <clears throat> we could say your Krishna conscious database within your heart. So now if anyone ever asks you a question about that, you know the exact answer because you've gone through it. And so you just accumulate this year after year after year after year. And you know, I have to answer so many questions. And, and you probably notice that I don't usually have to think much about them because I've already thought about them previously, right? So, um, and sometimes maybe you'll be asked a question and you don't actually have the answer. And you'll say, I need to discuss this and I need to do, do more research because I don't have the answer. And then you do the research, you come up with the answer. Now that's in your database. So you're just adding to your database as you progress in Krishna consciousness. So, you know, it's not, um, and, and sometimes in class, maybe you'll share a realization and at the end of class, someone will say, I don't agree with that. And then there'll be a discussion. And maybe you convince them that you were right. Maybe they convince you that they were right. But ultimately, everyone benefits in the end. And we all get the clearer, the more clear understanding. <clears throat> Keeping in mind always that there can be more than one understanding or nuanced understandings. And those understandings may vary depending on what ashram you're in, what gender you are. Um, what level of Krishna consciousness you're in, and then on a higher level, what rasa you're in, which is not really something that um, is, is relevant to us, but it's relevant when you hear commentaries of acharyas, because they may be commenting from a perspective of a different rasa, because they may be in that rasa. So is that okay, Nadia? So it's not, it's not, it's not always a problem to put yourself out as an authority because you can always say, I don't know, or and or 
you you may make a mistake and as long as you're humble and willing to be corrected then you learn you know because it's because we're putting ourselves in a difficult position to teach krishna consciousness as an authority uh, when we feel like well i'm not a complete authority yet but this is how you learn to become an authority by putting yourself out taking these questions taking these difficult verses trying to you know what if what if you have to get Bhagavatam class on the fifth canto of the universe? This is Jambadweep, this is Bhu Mandala, these are the seven islands, this is Mount Sumero. You're gonna to have to really get into the fifth canto. You're gonna you know, call up your friend who's a scientist, you call up all your astronomer friends and scientist friends and like, can you explain this to me? And then they start explaining it and you go back. So you've learned so much. Now someone asks you a question about the universe, you know, you might be a nobody in ISKCON, but right now you know as much or, or more than most devotees. My, my daughter, when she was like 11 or something, had an assignment to, in her school to describe the universe according to Fifth Canto. So it was a group of them. And I still have in Mayapur their drawings. They drew out the whole universe. And she could just rat, rattle it off. Well, this is Bumundo, this is Mount Sumero, this is Jamba Dweep, this is that, this is this. It's like, wow, you know, so, you know, that was their assignment. They had to learn it. That's the beauty of taking this position of teacher. It just, it, it forces you to learn. So um, in answer to Nadia's question, one other thing we can say is that even, even advanced devotees sometimes have this problem. You know, they'll have a realization and they'll wonder, is that actually correct? They'll call one of their God brothers and say, well, what do you think? Is this correct? What do, and they'll say, well, I've thought about it also. You could see it this way. You could see it that way. I tend to think it's this way. So-and-so Maharaj thinks it's that way. At least now when you answer that question, you can say, some think this, some think that. And you can share what your realization is and say, this is my realization, but I invite you to, to go into it and study it more. That's okay. Because some, some parts of our philosophy are like that. Uh, they they're meant to be studied more deeply, and and I heard once one, one sannyasi he said don't listen to any of my lectures pre such and such date because I don't agree with what I said, I was too narrow minded or one sided or fanatical or whatever, or I didn't I didn't have the realizations that I have now and a lot of what I said I don't agree with. Obviously, a lot of what I said I do, but there's some things I don't. So that, that also happens. And it's, it's just inevitable. I think the problem is, is when you share a realization that may be a little bit on shaky ground as absolute. This is absolutely how it is, 100%. There's no doubt. Which, of course, you can do when you're absolutely sure, without a doubt. But sometimes you're absolutely sure without a doubt and you're not right, and so you have to be careful. And in that, that case, you say something, according to my understanding, it's like this. Other devotees have different understanding. So, or this is what Prabhupada, you know, people say this and that, this is what Prabhupada said, it's right here, I'll read the purport. So those are ways to deal with that. Um, and now we have Gabriela. Is there a way to designate, destigmatize the concept of guru or spiritual master. In my country, there is a lot of rejection from youth to these concepts and roles because of what has happened in history. Gurus who have abused their power, who have enriched themselves with people's money, or who have been very authoritarian. Also, the youth many times wonder, why should I follow a spiritual master if my own mastery, if I have my own mastery within me. Um, well, let's start with a second question. One of the, let, let's, let's, let's just answer the second question uh, and answer it that we're dealing with a real guru. So we're dealing with someone who's actually a guru who, who doesn't have the problems that you mentioned, who doesn't do the things you mentioned. So if there is a real guru, then Krishna says, tad bidi pradipatena, paripashnina sebi, or, or so many verses. Um, 
you you must take a guru. Guru Ashraya, you take shelter. Um, you know, Abhigat Chet, uh, you must take a guru. It means you must. Sa guru eva abhigat. You know, this, this is the Shastra that, that what, what the guru will do is you, you do have mastery, you do have realization, but it will increase when you have a guru because your guru will help you become more advanced so you can take more guidance from super soul so you're taking guidance from super soul now if you have a guru you will go further and you'll get more guidance from super soul and so it's our shastra that we must do this this is the process so that's why we have limitations so we need to take shelter of someone who's higher krishna is pleased when you do it when you serve that vaishnav you'll get krishna's mercy by doing that so then now the question is, how to know who's bona fide, how to avoid um, a, a guru who abuses his position. The problem is that in this world, obviously anybody can abuse their position. Even someone who starts out with pure intention can abuse it. Fortunately, if you study ISKCON, very few gurus in the last decade or two have misused or abused their position. Most of that happened right after Prabhupada left when they were young and inexperienced. <clears throat> and some gurus who have misused or abused their position step down in realization that they're, mis that they're not strong enough to do it, <clears throat> which is not you know, what we want, but at least it's honorable. At least they're not they're not, they realize that I, I'm not actually qualified for this position. So um, we would say, take your time, do your homework, get to know that guru. You can, you know, f find the guru who you see does not abuse their position. Find that guru who's, who sometimes would apologize when he makes a mistake or if he chastises you and, and it has a bad result, he will, he will say, I'm sorry I did that. Uh, I thought you needed it, but forgive me. Yeah. That's not maybe so much of a traditional role of a spiritual master to ask forgiveness from his disciples or apologize, but sometimes he will. Um, so did you, for you, for, for the devotees who feel this way, then that would be my suggestion. Um, you will benefit from a guru. Understandably, your faith is shaken by seeing bad examples. But your faith, if you see the right example, your faith will increase. You know, it's like the whole Rithik thing, it gets rid of this whole problem. Then there's no gurus, it's only Prabhupada. And so there's no problem with being exploited by a guru because there aren't any, it's only Prabhupada. Another problem it solves, right? So-called problem. But the Shastra says you have to take shelter of the living guru. So it doesn't solve the problem. The real the real thing is it shouldn't be the problem of the disciple. It should be the problem of the guru to be exemplary. So it's really the onus is on the guru. It's not the disciple shouldn't have to go through this. It's unfortunate, but they do. So buyer beware, take more time. There are, I would just tell those people, there are gurus who are pure and for which these things will never happen. And you have to find that guru and you have to be convinced. And, and when you associate with that person year after year after year and you see uh, their purity and so forth, then, then you'll be okay. Is that okay, Gabriella? Well, she has the second part of the question. Let's see. Here, there is also a lot of rejection from women in general towards spiritual disciplines because they only have men in power positions, power positions. So it's difficult to preach between groups of young women. So what can we do to include this young people? Oh, that's easy. You become guru, Gabriella. Um, um, so what we'll do is before the next meeting, you will give me all the questions and I'll give you all the answers and then you just do it. And someday, when we go through enough meetings, enough questions and answers, you'll have all the answers, and then you'll do it all. 
and then I'll just chant 64 rounds in Vrindavan. Oh, actually, you'll all do it, and you know, I won't have to do it anymore. I mean, when when I give class, I'm not I'm not just thinking I'm teaching you for your benefit. I think I'm teaching you so you can teach others, so you can understand what is the siddhanta, so you can give it to others. So I'm definitely thinking I'm I'm also training you how to do this. So what you say is true, and that's why we need more women in positions of teachers for other women. So it might be easier to hear from a woman. Something, I don't know, you can consider because you know the situation. So that's, that is a thought. And you might say, yeah, well, I don't know. I can't give a talk like you gave. All right, well then, let's get the questions in advance and we'll discuss them. And then you can. Why not? If you know the answers, you can give them. What do you think? You ready? <laughs> well, you know what, Gabriella? I wasn't ready either. And you have to jump in the ocean and learn to swim sometimes. Um, the other thing you can do is you can invite um, women to do, pro invite, invite more women to do programs. You know, my god sisters or other women who you have respect for, you think would be a good fit for the people that you're teaching, invite them in and they can, they can teach. And those women are gurus, they're six-year gurus, although they're not giving diction, they're, they're gurus in their own right. I think you should invite Mother Rambaru to come and speak. You can invite Urmala, Pranada would be fantastic. I mean, there's so many, you know, you have unlimited list of senior women. What do you think? You like that idea better than you doing it? <laughs> All right, I'll give you one year. You get, you have this year to get ready, okay? I mean, you know, um, if you listen to enough classes, whether mine or others, for a year or two or three, you're gonna know how to answer 90 plus percent of the questions people ask because you've heard them asked in the classes, right? Um, Nadi says, I like so much to help new devotees. That's true, it's so inspiring and it also helps me, yeah. One of, one of the, helps me improve my sadhana. One of the great things about teaching is it's just, it's just natural to want to be an example of what you're teaching. Because if you're not, you just, you feel very guilty. Uh, how can I tell them to do something and I don't even do it? I don't want to teach unless I follow it. And one, uh, one devotee said that many teachers in the secular world have a policy that they won't teach anything that they're not living. So he, he was saying, you know, this is my policy. And I, then I thought, I thought, that's a very good policy. That unless I will not teach it if I don't live it. And so... Uh, it's it's been a great inspiration for me, and um, I remember when I was living in Mayapur, um, I would sometimes leave Mayapur and visit different temples. And then when I'm in those temples, I would be giving lots of classes. And I actually felt the need to leave Mayapur for my own spiritual benefit to go give a lot of classes. So it's very very powerful. So Christy says. I always wanted to ask this. Looking back at Prabhupada's time, everyone was serving Prabhupada and doing whatever was needed. It seems everything was going towards one direction. Today, it often feels we are torn towards two different directions, serving at the temple and serving at one's, serving one spiritual master, yes. Even though theoretically, all service is for Prabhupada and serving at the temple is the same as serving one spiritual master. But if we would all be serving only at the temple, nobody would be helping their spiritual masters. Well, it's not a problem because lots of people don't live near temples and lots of people don't have service in temples. So, you know, you're living in a temple. So it's, I think it's more relative to you. Or if you want to distribute books, then you cannot help as much at the temple. Um, well, how to balance this out? Um, as I said, congregational members, a lot of them are not connected with temples and don't have service there. 
And um, one, one should never think that my service to the temple is not service to my spiritual master. You know, like you're distributing books. Why are you distributing books, Chris Day? I didn't, I don't like that. You need to be translating this. You know, no, that would be, you know, the spiritual master generally wouldn't do that. You know, and and actually there's there's protocol. I don't know if there's laws, but there's protocol within ISKCON that a spiritual master should not engage a disciple in, in a way that it minimizes this, their responsibilities they have in their temple, you know, which would also mean taking money, you know, getting, you know, you're, you're giving so much money to your temple every month. Now you say, oh, I'll give it to my spiritual master and you give nothing to the temple. That's not really serving your spiritual master. I mean, you know, in some, you know, what your spiritual master just got in an accident, he needs money for an operation. That's different, but on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the, and the temples also understand you have a spiritual master, you want to serve him so that, you know, each party balances, right? The temple president says, oh, all right, let me give you time every week so you can do some project for your spiritual master. And your spiritual master says, yeah, do what your temple president says. Ask him if he can give you some time for the service. Um, one of my disciples was moving into a temple and she was doing a lot of service, time consuming service. And I said, can you ask them to give you time to do that service. And so she asked and they said, yes, we will give you that time. So, you know, it's, you work together, but, but whatever service you do is service to your guru, even if it's not direct, because it's service to ISKCON. Service to ISKCON is service to Prabhupada, service to Prabhupada, service to your guru. And that can be worked out with your authority and worked out with your guru. And you could tell your guru, you know, you want me to do this, but I have this, this seva. And then sometimes a disciple can also consider, well, my spiritual master wants to do this. If we are able to do this, it's going to be really amazing for the preaching. And, um, you know, I'm just doing flower garlands at the temple, and I think I can get someone else to do the flower garlands. But what he wants me to do, I'm the only one who can do it because I know, you know, this computer science or I know this language. Or So sometimes the disciple may make that, can may discern, you know, like, well, I, or, or it's something my spiritual master wants me to do this, and I really am inspired to do this. And what I'm doing at the temple is nice, but it's not really utilizing my talents as much, and I really want to do the service. So then you discuss that, either with your temple president or with your guru or both. Uh, okay, so now we're finally going to read a letter from Prabhupada after all that introduction. For. Guru Maharaj, we have two more questions. Oh, below you, below that. Oh, okay. Uh, and one is from me. It's right above the letter, and another one is from um, oh. Krishna. Oh, it's right above the letter. So, Nadia says, "Is it okay to pray and cry for some particular service, or we should just pray? Let me do whatever you want. Either one depends on your mood and your advancement. Both are okay." I've done both many times. I got tired of praying for a particular service. So then I said, Krishna, what do you want me to do? Um, half hour later, they told me that GBC said, we need you to go to Israel. Seriously, like a half hour. It was during Japa. I was saying, Krishna, whatever you want me to do. You know? And I said, well, the GBC was just meeting. We have this problem in Israel. Would you be able to go there? We thought you'd be good. I was like, okay. A week or two later, I was off. Uh, so, you know, it depends. It depends on who you are. It depends on your mood. Because you may pray, Nadia, Krishna, um, just whatever you want, and you'll spend the rest of your life in Siberia peeling potatoes in the snow. So you might think, okay, I'm not going to pray like that anymore. That was dangerous. So, you know, if your faith, you have to have, you have to have a certain level of faith to pray Krishna whatever you want, right? Because he may give you whatever you want. Krishna, you know, whoever you send, I will marry. Well, what if he sends a monster? You know, you're going to marry him. You know, the, the next day someone proposes to you and you go, well, this must be it. Krishna sent him. But then you find out, you know, he's, he's not the right one. So, you know, um, I think it requires some realization, Krishna, whatever you want. And, and um, 
which is okay to pray that way as long as you accept what Krishna sends. Krishna, whatever you want, then he sends something. Why did you send that? That's not nice. That's not fair. You know, I thought you were God. I thought you loved me. You know? So, you know, if that's your realization, probably better not pray whatever you want. Better pray. I want, can you help me with this service? Something like that. So, you know, everything has to be according to realization. Now, you might say, but isn't it better to pray Krishna whatever you want? And say, yeah, it is better, but it's not better if you're not ready for it because then it just backfires, you know. So you, you, you have to have, you know, some grounding that your prayer should be according to your realization and your, you know, you actually mean it. Because if you pray for it and at heart you don't mean it, what's the point, you know? I was reading this book, was it by a Christian on forgiveness? It was the first book I had read on forgiveness, you know, secular, well, you could call it secular, but it was from a pastor. And he said, Sometimes he said, you should pray for the person that you're trying to forgive. That you, know, you should pray that all good comes to them. And he says, but the problem is sometimes you pray that all good will come to them, but you actually don't want all good to come to them. You actually want them to suffer because that will make you feel good because they cause you to suffer, isn't it? I mean, that's material consciousness. So you're praying like a good Christian, God have mercy on them, and then all of a sudden you see, you know, their material life is getting better. They have a hundred new friends. You're like, damn, you know, why them and not me? They don't deserve it. So, you know, he was saying, good point. If you're going to pray for it, you know, you better mean it. Otherwise, what's the point, you know? So, so the answer to your question is yes or yes, depending on what's best for you. Okay, now we have more questions. Christy says, today, actually, today, one younger devotee asked me the exact same question I once asked you, and I gave him exactly the same answer, um, which is all I do is give you Prabhupada's answer. And um, so, you know, that's the way it works. From Krishna Kanta, all the way from Mayapur. Krishna Kanta is locked up in Mayapur. What a blessing. On the topic of Ritvik, I saw that something happened at ISKCON Bangalore. Is it still going on? Yeah. Do they still use the name of ISKCON? I don't know, but ISKCON, ISKCON Bangalore has four temples. Well, there are four temples in Bangalore, three definitely ISKCON, and one is Ritvik, and I don't think it's incorporated. I think they have a separate corporation that was never actually incorporated as ISKCON unfortunately. So that is a temple where if you go there and join there, you will be initiated by Prabhupada. Uh, one of our god brothers said, when they do that initiation on behalf of Prabhupada, he said, actually what's happening is you can't initiate on behalf of someone who's not alive. So they're actually becoming the disciple of the person who's doing the initiation. And the person who is doing the initiation doesn't know they've become the guru. And the person becoming a disciple doesn't know they've become a disciple. So it's like the ultimate, the ultimate cheating. Isn't that interesting? Angle, you know, like the ultimate sham of shams. Nobody even knows what's happening. Of course, they don't believe that, but at least um, because there is no such thing as initiating on behalf of a guru who's departed, the only reason, reasonable explanation would be that person is being initiated by the person who's giving the name and taking the vows. Now, they can, you can do that if the guru is alive and he's telling you, this is what I want you to do. But after he leaves, Robert said, after he leaves, while he's alive, you bring, the, you bring potential candidates to him. After he leaves, you initiate them. Now, the other thing is, is there really a significant difference between being initiated by Prabhupada's disciple and being initiated by Prabhupada? Um, I don't think so, because there's no evidence that people initiated by Prabhupada's disciples are not becoming Krishna conscious and that people initiated by Prabhupada are, it's because ultimately it depends on us. And you're getting the same thing. 
And so you might say, but Prabhupada was a better devotee. Not was, he still is. So you can't listen to Prabhupada now because you're initiated by somebody else. You can't um, read Prabhupada's books. You can't get all of that. Of course you can. And, and you get so much of it from your guru, from your Siksha guru. So it, it's, it's not really, it's not even logical. And, I, and, and of course, we could say, well, yeah, if you got Prabhupada's personal association, yeah, that would make a difference. But people who are getting Riftic initiation are not getting any more association with Prabhupada than you are. And you're getting association with your guru, which means you're one up on them. And they're not. They don't even have, they don't have a Diksha guru to get association with. And sometimes Prabhupada would say that, you know, people would say, well, can you, can you just take a guru like from a book? You know, like, why do you have to, you know, get initiated? He's the guru is in the book. And Prabhupada, and I think Prabhupada, I'm not sure, but I think he took someone by the ear. He said, the living guru can take you by the ear and pull you. Whereas he can correct you. So that's, you know, he said the book can't do that. I mean, indirectly it can, but, you know, you can go in one out, ear out the other, but the guru can just hold on to you and pull you. Get out of my, get away from this, get out of my, right? So how is it, you know, it's like, well, if you, their basic thing is, well, you just take Prabhupada as your guru, then you don't have to worry about fall downs. Yeah, okay, that's great. How many gurus have fallen down in the last 20 years? Right, and I think only two, and the two that fell down are still engaged in full-time devotional service. They had some, you know, they took a left turn somewhere. So, and um, not the end of the world for their disciples. And their disciples can take guidance from so many devotees, take guidance from Prabhupada, like that. So, um, that's what's going on in Iskand Bangalore. Okay, now we're going to read the letter. Is that it? We're ready? Okay, so remember the topic was pure, uh, that we are pure devotees on some level. February 4th, 1971, I was in Vancouver, Canada running a temple and it was snowing at that, around that time or maybe i was somewhere else in canada on traveling sankirtan i can't remember anyway i'm confident that if you simply take our principles very seriously and follow them rigidly everything will come out successfully our movement is being carried by spiritual strength from chanting of the Hare krishna maha mantra from the lips of pure devotees. Our disciples are pure, and therefore the effect is that this movement is gaining in scope all over the world. Now, people are highly appreciating our endeavors, and they are asking us to open centers in their respective cities and towns. So this is practically the fulfillment of Lord Chaitanya's desire, and it will come out for certain if you kindly keep the standard set by me and see that others are similarly enthused to follow. So I think we see the drift here in Prabhupada's letter. I've given you something pure. You hold on to it. You don't adulterate it. And you give that to others and they get something pure. And your, your purity is that you don't contaminate it. It's not your necessarily your personal purity of course, it's important, but the foundation is delivery, deliver of something pure. The more you're pure, you can say the more powerful your delivery will be. There's no question. But still, Prabhupada's spreading the movement with young people who are not that pure or that deep in their realizations or, or their understanding of philosophy, but they're following the basic principles and, and those basic principles help you become pure, and they're teaching those principles to other people so they can become pure. So then the whole thing is pure, right? Just like I go over to your house and you make me something and I say, wow, I love this. Can you give me the recipe? But then you explain everything 
well, you know, it says add two cups of water, but actually one and three quarters and make sure the water is warm because when it's not warm, it doesn't work. And it says one teaspoon of salt, just put a half, that's all you need. So you, you tell me everything and then I do it and I make it and it comes out like yours. And everyone says, Mahatma Prabhu, you are an amazing cook. And I go, no, actually not. I just follow the recipe. Um, the other day we had some guests and my wife made something. The guests were like, oh my God, that's the best I've ever had in my life. You know, you ever have that? That's what you want. That's what you want your guests to say. This, these are the best. How did you make them? And my wife brings out the box and goes, here's the box, just add water. <laughs> well, she said, she said a few things. She said, well, I, for eggs, I use this and I, you know, do this and that. But just, so she, so the guest is going to get the box, follow what my wife said, and she's going to have some guests to make the same thing. And the guests are going to say, oh my God, that's amazing. Right. So it's like that. You know, we do kirtan and we're all dancing and chanting and all these guests come over and they go, oh, this is amazing. It's like, did I, did I create that ecstasy? Did I create the holy name? Of course not. It's contained within it. It's not, I'm just, you know, giving it to you and preserving it, trying to chant humbly with a mood of service, trying to chant in a way you can all chant together, you know, building the kirtan up, you know, so everybody, beca it becomes more ecstatic and then trying to encourage everyone to dance. That much I can do. But, you know, if we chant, baby, I love you, I can do all that. It's not going to be the same. Maybe it's baby, I tried to love you, but it didn't work. Maybe that's all. When love no longer works, then what? Then what do you do next? So um, that was always our realization. We would, you know, people would become Krishna conscious, they would become enlivened, they would become happy. We didn't think, oh, just look at me, I'm so powerful, I made you happy. You know, we never thought that way. We understood what was happening. We were giving them something the same way we got it, so it still works. We didn't add any fil filters or, you know, like like in India, it's half milk and half water. It's never pure. It's never pure milk. It's always half water, because you know you make more money, right? And one devotee said that sometimes the milkman they have nightmares that they were actually delivering pure milk that there was no water in it. That's a nightmare for them. And Jai Patakamaraj would say. Um, They don't put water in the milk, they put milk in the water. That's that's more accurate, you know. Take your gallon of take your, you know, three quarter gallons of water and then pour a little milk in it. So um, so Prabhupada's point was, well, if you give something pure, it's gonna work, it's gonna act. And this is, and so Prabhupada would always say, but don't compromise. Give them something pure. This is this is our this is what we offer. You know, it's diamonds. You know, don't don't sell crystals. It's diamonds. If people want crystals, let someone else sell crystals. You'll sell diamonds. You'll get better quality people, but less customers. But it's a diamond, and so you don't want to compromise. So that was Prabhupada's mood, and that's what that's what we have, which makes us unique, and that's why all of you became devotees, right? If you know. If the person giving a lecture had a cigarette, you'd be like, get me out of here. Uh, these guys are bogus, right? Isn't it? Or he's drinking a you know, glass of wine while he's giving a lecture. No, so, so Prabhupada said many, many times that if it's pure, it'll work and it'll attract people. So don't, he would say, don't compromise to attract people. Don't compromise your, compromise your principles. Now, you may compromise for them and say, you know, we'll just chant one round or follow one principle. That's okay. But you don't compromise the standard. This is our standard. If you want to be Krishna conscious, eventually you have to come to the standard. For now, do something, anything. That's different. That's not a compromise. That's an adjustment for an individual. But a second initiated Brahmin, you're not going to say, well, you know, whatever. You know, just do what you can. 
No, you won't say that. No, you're Brahman. You must live Brahminically. Correct? Okay. So I think we're getting to the point. We have a few minutes before. Are there any other questions? Anything on Facebook? No, Maharaj. No more questions. One more letter? Okay. One more letter. We have three minutes, more or less, for a letter. December 14th. December 14th, 1972. I was in, I believe I was in Los Angeles. Your next question, after leaving this material realm, does the devotee remain forever with his spiritual master? The answer is yes. But I think you have got the mistaken idea in this connection. You speak of pure devotee, that he is Shaktivish avatar, that we should obey him only. In other words, referring to Prabhupada, Shaktivish avatar, obey him only. These things are wrong idea. In other words, Prabhupada is saying, you're thinking there's only one pure devotee. If anyone thinks like that, that a pure devotee should be obeyed and no one else, that means he is a nonsense. We advise everyone to address one another as Prabhu. Prabhu means master. So how the master should be disobeyed. Others, they are also pure devotees. All my disciples are pure devotees. Anyone sincerely serving the spiritual master is a pure devotee. It may be, so they were talking about this devotee, Siddha Sarup. Only he's a pure devotee. It may be Siddha Sarup or Ah, Siddha Sarup. Ah means not Siddha Sarup. This must be very clearly stated. It is not only that your Siddha Sarup is a pure devotee and not others. Do not try to make a faction. Siddha Sarup is a good soul, but others should not be misled. Anyone who has surrendered to the spiritual master is a pure devotee. There you go, Ritvix. Chew on that one for breakfast. Okay, well, so we will <laughs> we will discuss this tomorrow. Um, if you ever see me very adamant about something, like, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this, it's because I've heard it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again from Prabhupada. That's, you know, if I become fanatical, it's because I've heard it so much. There's like no question in my mind. So when, you know, you see letters like this, it's quite clear, isn't it? Very clear. Okay, so now we're going to officially end this class and officially start the Japa class.